Uh, my name is Mike Butcher. I am not a academic, nor am I a, uh, a, a bureaucrat or anything else. I am a journalist. I'm a scribbler. I write words for a living, and uh, and I'm a critic. So other people, write, these guys write plays, and I'm the critic. Um, so, but the, the reason I'm here is just to sort of backtrack. The reason I'm here is I've been looking. Uh, to some, some extent as a journalist for TechCrunch into some of the European programs and I think it's, I, I think, well first of all you must understand that I am a European, I believe in Europe, I am a supporter of Europe, I'm not one of these British people who goes around trashing Europe all the time, I'm not David Cameron, um, I'm, uh, I, I think Europe is a wonderful thing and a wonderful project and this has prevented us from going to war with each other again, well, you know, many years over. So I am signed up to Europe, don't worry about that. Uh, but I also want Europe to work. I want Europe to work well, I want our tax money, our tax euros, to be spent well by our overlords and to not to be spent on, on things which don't work and which, which uh, are a waste of money. And because I think you know it's a fundamental principle of democracy that there's no taxation without representation, and therefore we need our taxation represented. So I'm here to do some representation. But one of the things I think is um, important about uh, how Europe and the Commission and the various projects that we as a as a as a as a continent you know engage in is is making sure that the money that we spend on, especially on new technology, is, uh, um, synchronizes as in, and is in tune with what is going on in the technology world and with the marketplace. And if we don't keep an eye on that, then we will be in trouble. Let me just explain something to you. Um, in, um, let me just uh, remind myself here, let's see. Uh, There was a, um, in 1865, if you cast your minds back, um, I'm sure you remember, as many of you, uh, that uh, there was an act uh, in the UK called, in England, called the Locomotive Act. And the Locomotive Act was designed to stop automobiles driving too fast. And what happened was that a man would have to run with a red flag Imagine me running in front of a car in 1865 with a red flag that only was were only allowed to go four miles per hour, and four miles per hour is the speed limit. If you went above that, you would be against the Locomotive Act, and the Locomotive Act was brought in by stagecoach owners, people who owned horses and carriages, to stop all cars going faster because it was fundamentally against automotive. These damn motor cars going too fast than coaches, for heaven's sake, you need to slow those guys down. And, uh, and also there was a safety issue, uh, people didn't want to get uh, run over by cars, we were, people, cars were a bit rare on the roads then. And um, unfortunately, that act pretty much killed innovation in Britain. In, uh, and and uh, so automobile, the automobile industry actually was taken over by the French and the Germans. Fantastic, good luck to them. But interestingly, some of the earliest electric cars were developed in, in the UK. So electric car innovation was stopped as well. Wouldn't it be a different world if electrical car innovation had not been stopped because of a, a, an act that had to have a, a man running in front of a car going at four miles an hour? So I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. Now, the reason I'm here is that I wrote an article saying why is the European Commission spending 100 million euro on a pointless hackathon? Now, I'm just a journalist. I'm just, you know, fundamentally here to ask stupid questions. And, and, and what was interesting to me is that I was wrong. So what the European Commission was doing was not spending 100 million euro on a pointless hackathon. That's fantastic. Thank God for that. But it was spending money on things which I'm not sure that it's, you know, I think we need to know where this project has come from and where it goes to next and how it actually fundamentally, how does it fundamentally synchronise with what is going on in the extremely fast moving pace of private sector innovation. 
And I do not want, ladies and gentlemen, want us as Europe to be standing, you know, throwing another man with a red flag in front of our car. Uh, just to explain that the, um, what was going on with it, we, we had um, things like um, the 100 million, 140 million dollars or 100 million euro spent on the first iteration of this project on a fireware sandbox environment to trial prototypes to get feedback on things like smart cities uh, and other kinds of applications. Now, it's never been properly explained to me what technologies these are built on. It's ne there's no, I can't find actually much documentation about what actual technologies we're talking about. Are we talking about uh, open access APIs, Lim Linux, open source? Are we talking about uh, Windows? Are we talking about Android? Are we talking about iOS? What fundamental technologies are we talking about? What platforms? So there's, there seems to be a sort of a disconnect between how people talk about this thing. We hear about a lot about fireware, and we hear a lot about how it's opening up things to a private sector, to, to hackers and to engineers to build new applications, but we don't hear what are they are supposed to be actually using. Um, we've, heard, we've seen things like um, competitions where um, entrants could uh, share prize money for 56,000 56, euros or 145,000 euros for com competitions. This sounds eerily familiar now to the new project to create accelerators for zero percent share ownership in these uh, companies. Now one of the problems is, is that what we're seeing is not the development of new products which then go to market and create jobs and wealth and pay mortgages and send kids to school and things like that and are able to be taxed so, and, and, and therefore, new businesses where we can then produce tax revenue and then build up our societies, etc. What we seem to be doing is throwing money at people to do projects and prototypes and not produce product. What is fundamentally, I'm extremely concerned about is Europe producing products. Products I can hit, I can what, put on my phone, projects that I can use, project as me as a European citizen that I can actually see, tell, taste, smell, etc. almost, almost. Um, we've got uh, lots of competitions. Now, I mean, even if, when you drill down, the devil is in the detail, is it not? Uh, Food Loop was mentioned as an example of the, one of these successful companies. Now, I could not find Food Loop on Google. Couldn't find it. Eventually, I found on the sort of 10th page of Google search, uh, it was uh, foodloop.de, but basically dead. So this product is dead, not going anywhere, unless it is going somewhere and I can't tell if it's going somewhere or not. That's fantastic. But what I'm worried about is we are getting our young people in Europe to spend time and money and effort creating products which don't go anywhere particularly, don't create new products, and then don't actually create wealth, and then don't create tax revenue, that uh, wonderful commission and, and everyone else can tax and then lift the rest of up, uh, us up, uh, in those of us who are not so privileged as myself. Um, we, want, we want people creating real wealth, real products, real companies. That's what we want. Um, we do not want ca Firewares Campus Day hacks on GitHub gathering mothballs going nowhere, for instance, where I saw, I saw that uh, a lot of the code that was developed at some of these hack days and the campus days, etc., is sitting idling, not turning into real products, real companies, real things. I want this code to be going into real companies, real products, as I keep saying. I'm sorry, I have to keep repeating myself. I want these companies to be acquired by Google for a billion dollars, as uh, or, uh, or 500 million dollars has happened to a company in London recently called DeepMind which has absolutely nothing to do with fireware whatsoever. So, because I want there to be a fundamental connection, fundamental connection, not a fundamental disconnection between uh, European efforts to create new technologies and the actual private sector market, which does not have a red flag for, uh, flying in front of its car. Right? Um, A couple of final points. Um, 
what we need is one of the problems I think also is that uh, is that um, is that the motivation of extremely smart CTOs, engineers, technical people is not in um, simply creating new technologies. It's creating uh, things like wealth for themselves. Right? That's why they join startups. They join startups because they want to be the next Mark Zuckerberg, and um, and they want to be a billionaire. That's right, basically. And that, but they want to make money, but they also want to be creative. And they they're not going to be create new technologies just for the sake of it. Europe was a pioneer in 3G. Nokia was a pioneer in 3G and 3G standards and a pioneer in mobile technologies. Where is all that today? Where is it all? It's patents and which are uh, basically licensed by Apple and Android and Google and and well Microsoft as well. So Microsoft now owns Nokia. So the real all the value then has shifted into these people who make these companies make products, not simply research, not simply new technologies. They productize this, these technologies. Um, the requirements of some of the fire, of fireware, the, the idea that it should create, you know, it should be fundamentally, you know, uh, any project submitted to the fireware platform should, you know, have all the uh, T's crossed and the I's dotted, etc. in terms of software. This is completely alien these days to how software is created extremely fast, it's build it, it's break it, it's kick the tires, see if it works, it's a minimum viable product, basically some of this stuff doesn't even work, and, but they work out how people use it, and then they iterate on that feedback. They don't produce gold standard. The waterfall, if those of you who are familiar with some of the terms of software creation, the waterfall method is over, pretty much. Now it's all about agile and minimum viable product. Um, the accelerator model, as I say, 150,000 euros for zero uh, percent share. Well, this is basically going to break the model of many successful private sector accelerators in Europe who are already doing very well and actually now coming up to that sort of money. And, the, and it's not about the money, you've got to remember, it's not about the much amount of money you give to a startup because 150,000 euros. When you have to pay two CTOs 60,000 euros a year, or two engineers, will be gone like that, in an instant. Nothing at all. It's not seed money, it's not particularly useful, it doesn't get you access to venture capital, it just throws money at the wall and sees what sticks. But, and it doesn't uh, do, the important thing is, any company that's going to get that kind of money is going to fail unless they get follow-on money, and all that follow-on money is coming from the private sector, and you need to incentivize the private sector to be involved from the beginning. Now, there's nothing wrong with this public-private sector partnership. There are too many P's in these sentences. FIP, God knows what else. Um, there's nothing wrong with us being partnership with the, uh, with the uh, private sector in infrastructure, in terms of, and that's something I'll, I'll mention later, in terms of. Um, the support networks or the, you know, just the fundamental sort of business environment, shall we say, getting rid of red tape, allowing businesses to thrive, allowing people to hire and fire, and, 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 all, and uh, with obviously protections in mind, but also allowing businesses to accelerate quickly. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, but uh, once we start develop, getting into the uh, fundamental sort of funding models, I think we start to kind of break and we start to basically compete with the private sector who uh, frankly, are just better at, better at it than us, uh, than this, than than uh, commission in uh, uh, ideas. Oh, sorry, I shall I shall race to the end now. Um, but very very briefly, my final point, and I, I can elucidate on some of my other points later, is that there is we need to make sure with all of these initiatives that there is not a fundamental disconnect disconnect between commercial applications, between entrepreneurs and startups, between these initiatives and the speed of innovation, remember our man with the red flag, because innovation and technology is doubling, you know, all industry now is subject to Moore's law, the uh, doubling of uh, computing power every 18 months, and the halving of cost every 18 months. 
all, all industry is now subject to that now. And so if that is the case, therefore we must understand that innovation is going way faster and we can even formulate a plan. So I think I say, let's just get rid of the plan and let's try and make sure we get the fundamentals right. I also think there's a lot of unclear messaging about the Fireware project, uh, the Fireware and the uh, FIP project. And, that, um, and that on the positive side, my solutions are that we must encourage European governments to open up to, uh, access to open data, to create APIs for the private sector startups to innovate on, whether it be travel, whether it be medicine, you name it. Uh, we must get the fundamentals right around our education systems. Uh, we must get the fundamentals right about uh, edu uh, infrastructure, broadband. We need to be the South Korea, the second South Korea, as it were, of Europe. Europe needs to be the second South Korea. And we must also address the much bigger issue of net neutrality. And net neutrality will come up, uh, will come up in the next few years. So that's my piece, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.